Hello and welcome to another ATP in Philosopher video with myself, Jonathan MSP. This is a Ukraine War Update Extra video to give you the extra information and tidbits, nuggets to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the current war in Ukraine. Uh, just going to start with a bit of Darth Putin, always good for a tongue-in-cheek, uh, acerbic critique. So someone asked, what's the difference uh, between Russia acquiring Iranian drones and Ukraine getting Patriots. Of course, it's obvious. One's offensive, the other's defensive. Uh, Darth Putin says, threatening to defend yourself against our peaceful Iranian drones we use to denazify hospitals and playgrounds is a dangerous escalation. Perfect. Um, well said. Uh, right, let's go to... Uh, well, we're going to think a little bit about the saturation attack that has just happened today in Ukraine. So there were a whole range of missiles sent against Ukraine, as we have seen on a fairly regular basis. Today, 37 out of the 40 sent at or against Kyiv were shot down. So that's a really good percentage for those, obviously three uh, still finding their targets or somewhere near their targets. So that causes a problem. But we have seen increased proportion of missiles taken out of the sky before they hit their targets over the last few attacks. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what the final stats are for this round. Right, I just thought I'd get the latest figures. So the latest figures I could find was 60 out of the 76 Russian missiles launched at Ukraine were shot down. 60 Russian cruise missiles, including air launch KH-101s and KH-555 and sea-based caliber missiles were shot down in Russia's seventh miss mass missile attack on Ukraine uh, today. The Ukrainian Air Force reported that works out to be about a 79% hit rate. I don't know if that's, I'll have to look at the stats. I think it might be a little bit of a dip actually maybe, but it, it just does depend where these are and you know, so on and so forth. Lots of variables, but uh, certainly lots taken out um, and not doing what they were intended to do. And, you know, the consequences are pretty widespread. What I wanted to show you, is some footage but i'm not going to show you footage because a lot of it's inappropriate but this is a trench uh network somewhere near bakhmut as far as i understand where 35 to 40 soldiers were uh, arranged um and the ukrainian artillery hit them with both mortar and air blasted shells so i'm just going to show you what air blasted shells were now apparently a good 17 of these died now what was interesting about this video is that actually this is a screen and there's someone with a pointer as they were as a drone was going over the trenches it was literally counting the dead so when we talk about how do they get these figures certainly there, there would have been a report done from this where the guy was counting the dead and the wounded um so i thought that was quite interesting but i can't show it to you because it's inappropriate but let me just show you some of the airburst shells so you can see his pointer just down there. So I'm just getting the video to the right place. This shows you um, a large explosion. That uh, seems like a regular artillery shell, maybe a shrapnel shell. And then these are your airburst shells. So these appear to explode before they hit the ground and release a whole bunch of stuff into a large uh, radius. So that's your airburst shells. Anyway, this was uh, pretty pretty devastating for the Russians. There were a lot of deaths involved in that. And um, it, yeah, uh, but I, I want to just explain these airburst shells. So airburst or um, an airburst or airburst is the detonation of an explosive device such as an anti-personnel artillery shell or a nuclear weapon even in the air instead of on contact with the ground or target. The principal military advantage of an airburst over a ground burst is that energy from the explosion as well as any shell fragments uh, are distrib distributed more evenly um, over a wider area. However, the peak energy is lower at ground zero. Um, basically, there used to be, or most standard shells are sort of shrapnel shells. That uh, So modern shells sometimes, though sometimes called shrapnel shells, actually produce fragments and splinters and not shrapnel. So they hit your target, maybe the ground, and explode with shrapnel sort of flying out from, from that centre of, of the target. 
Now, airbursts were first used in the First World War to shower enemy positions with uh, and men with shrapnel balls to kill the largest possible number with a single burst. When infantry moved into deep trenches, shrapnel shells were rendered useless and high explosive shells were used to attack field fortifications and troops in the open. The time fuses for the shells could be set to function on contact or in the air or at a certain time after contact, um, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, a relatively recent example of airburst munitions is a VOG 25P jumping 40 millimeter caseless grenade, which contains a secondary charge to launch it up 1.5 meters above its in point of impact before the main charge detonates. Uh, so you get these different ones that they obviously hit the target and then jump up and then explode. And so there are all these di different types of ones that you have. But the ones we see here are look like they are probably some form of, they might have ball bearings in, they might have, uh, I'm not 100% sure, but they are exploding above the target and then raining down sort of uh, effectively the equivalent of sort of shrapnel um, in 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 the area. But, you know, there'll be things like tungsten ball bearings and all sorts uh, of nasty stuff. So that's, that's that. Uh, just an example of a way munitions can be used in a different way than maybe some of you might be aware. Now, given that there seems to be, in fact, it's probably worth me uh, showing you my most recent article. And I wrote this last night and I gave props to The Truth, who's a commenter on my channel. Uh, so this is on Only Sky, where where I write, where I'm a journalist. And this is, he shouted too early, the impotence of Putin. So taking the idea of what the truth was saying in one of the, his comments and, and putting it together in, into an article. Uh, and the, the point of this is to say that Putin has nowhere else to go, really. So I've talked about this a lot. He's, his escalation only goes to nuclear now like yeah you could talk about chemical weapons but i think that's unlikely so if it's nuclear then if he's unlikely to to really go for nuclear we might as well start giving ukraine lots of stuff so the idea that we're going to give them patriots is probably not enough to to get putin to escalate to nuclear so Therefore, if we can give them patriots, let's give them all sorts of stuff. And in fact, you are starting to hear that to being the case. Um, we have heard yesterday that Defence Secretary of the UK, Ben Wallace, didn't say no to the storm shadow. I said to you the other day, I showed you a list of nine, I think, different air defence systems. And seven of them have already been given to Ukraine. Well, why not give some of the others that are still on that list, such as storm shadow? It's a UK cruise missile. And Ben Wallace has not ruled it out, and I, I think indicated that they are actually in talks concerning that cruise missile. This is uh, great news, and, and I just think we might as well be pushing the envelope now. I don't think giving them Storm Shadow in this example is going to trigger nuclear. So therefore, give them that. Just don't even think about it. And then give them the uh, GLSDB, the Boeing Saab, uh, collaboration, these 100-mile strike weapons. Give them these that we've been talking about. ATACMs. Just throw them all at Ukraine and push that envelope out because I, uh, my personal opinion is that Ukraine need stuff and they need it now. Of course they need it now, 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 now. now but I think where Russia have potentially got 200,000 mobilised troops being able to be added into the mix around well, the new year, um, springtime and given that Belarus are sort of posturing at the moment uh, and given that Russia are able to send these waves of missiles over albeit like depleting stocks um, at an unsustainable rate Ukraine need to be able to go on the offensive they need to be able to they can't just sit back and take this and take this and take this they need to go on the offensive like they did in Kharkiv like they did in Kherson, they need another big offensive and and really they need some weapons that will enable them to do that. And um, just to go left field, let's just show you uh, what life is like from the point of view of, of a fighter in the trenches. Uh, this is pretty fascinating footage. Is 
Da. So he's got those magazines to fill with rounds now, and that's that's what he sets himself about doing. But I find this quite interesting because here he is on a front line, and yet he takes his time to put his mobile phone in the right place because he wants some good footage. <laughs> just like the way we do war is just really different. Quite incredible. So he gets his rounds out, and really he could do with some kind of quick round loader because he puts them in by hand. But it's interesting, like, you know, they're almost having... Just almost sort of laughing there, having... Listening to his mates. Just, uh, it's just incredible footage. In the middle of a firefight. It's absolutely fascinating. But think of that time that he's wasting loading these rounds. I mean, it would be really useful if, if that could be done a lot quicker uh, if you had some kind of uh, help to do that um, but anyway there you go just an interesting bit of firefight I saw um, Combat Veteran uh, YouTube channel today there's a really interesting firefight that he analyzes uh, in the Bakhmut area as well anyway let's go up into the sky these are this is some and more aerial footage I just I'm fascinated by aerial footage less of the music um, and this uh, pilot is releasing a load of harm. So these missiles, they seek out radiation. So radars that produce uh, radiation and they, they home in on that and target that. And th this would be suppression of enemy air defense um, activities. Now, on the flip side, I've seen Lancet loitering munitions again, taking out Ukrainian uh, uh, radar systems so they are presenting a problem still don't know whether that's it might be footage from the summer though you know, it's very difficult to tell sometimes at least one of them was because it's all very green but another one looked like it it wasn't now this is interesting from uh rybar or rubar uh rubar uh i mentioned how in one of my previous videos the uk have admitted in an article that uh, the Marines were involved in some discrete operations in Ukraine. Well, actually, right by here compiles all the examples that they have of the UK being involved in uh, uh, operations on the ground. So the Times, for the first time, publicly acknowledged the deployment of Royal Marines in Ukraine. Lieutenant General Robert McGowan said the Marines supported some discrete operations in a hugely sensitive environment due to a high uh, level of political and military risk. Previously, Britain had only acknowledged the involvement of the SAS, the Special Airborne Service, specialists in operation in Ukraine. For example, 350 Marines of the 45 Commando 3rd uh, uh, Commando Brigade were dispatched to Ukraine to protect diplomats at the beginning of the year. They were sent from Norway, where the 45 Commando took part in exercises to Poland, and from there they went to Ukraine. After Russian troops left Kyiv in April, the Marines moved to Lviv, to the Ukrainian capital. Lieutenant General McGowan admits that in addition to guarding diplomats, which is what they were doing at the time, the Marines engaged in other tasks. Oh, while we're here, we'll uh, help out with this, including covert operations, but not combat operations, he assures the public. In April, the Times acknowledged a special air service, uh, special airborne service uh, soldiers had returned to Kyiv to train Ukrainian ATGM crews. In May, we wrote about British military advisors in the entourage of the governor of Zaporizhia. Alexander Staruk. In addition, we mentioned the training of Ukrainian recon groups in Kharkiv region under the guidance of British special agents to carry out sabotage on the territory of the Russian Federation. Of course, this is all from the Russian point of view, but it's interesting if this is all true. In June, the fact of participation of British special forces in combat actions on the side of Ukraine was confirmed by a mercenary from the International Legion. Hardly anyone doubted that the number of British specialists in Ukraine was limited to 100 servicemen. We Now we have further confirmation of direct military intervention by the British armed forces in the military conflict, conflict between Russia and Ukraine. I haven't heard any official line from the Russians here, but that is certainly very uh, interesting development and, and worth, uh, worth knowing about. Um, this call and I'll play you this and, and read the subtitles, is an intercepted mobile phone call from a Russian mobilized troop to his mother and is a pretty shocking, um, nothing that we weren't expecting, haven't heard before, but uh, it's still worth listening to. 
Um, a panicked Russian soldier tells how Mobix was sent on suicide missions while the officers ran away. So here we go. So I'll, again, for those who are listening, I'll read this out. I'm going to turn the sound off now. So and lots of swearing in this, so I'll try and be uh, appropriate. I've got F all left to live. It's F'd. Where we're standing, it's a meat grinder, he says. His mum says, enough. What are you saying? Nothing. Anyway, we were attacked. Ahead of us were ho holes. On the left were ho holes. On the right were ho holes. And they, the command, didn't want to withdraw us. They said uh, to f f uh, stand until the end. We're shipping dead Mobix in packages. Packages. Imagine not just one person, 17 people per day. Effing hell. So that's interesting. And, uh, uh, you know, what does uh, the shifting packages of dead bodies, basically, in multiple bodies at a time, and 17 a day is the number he gives. And mum says, enough, enough. Why are you saying this? You know, obviously, she doesn't want to hear the negative side of it. Nothing. You think it's effing fun here? It's not effing fun. It's war. Now, I'm not saying fun. I'm just, ours have effed up. Entered incorrect adjustment data. Effed up everything we have. Our own guys. So this, I don't know whether this is referring again to being hit by friendly fire, which is something we have heard before from interceptions, saying that they've ended up being um, artillery bombarded by their own artillery. Uh, he continues, we have nothing. Clothes are wet, dirty, no clothes. Uh, not brought any water for three days. No water at all. The mobilised officer worked as a foreman all his life. He's looking at you with empty eyes. The, this elevator yesterday, and I'm not sure what, I, I think there's an incorrect translation there because I don't think it's an elevator. Um, they are, appear to be out in a field somewhere. So he said we needed to take the elevator, but now, but how can we take it when there are three machine guns there? He said, this is talking about his commander, there was an order to take it. 17 mobilised people, people were immediately killed, barely stood up on the field. Then we got shelled with mortars and we carried them. Turned around, but he, the officer, was already gone. He already ran 500 metres ahead of us. And it's interesting because that footage I showed you earlier, the airburst, there was a claim that 17 people had died there. And, you know, it could could be that engagement. Who knows? But uh, unlikely. But uh, there you go. So just interesting that the mobilised troops are still having the same problems that there must be just so many troops dying. And of course, the question is whether that's happening on both sides. So this is that that same uh, footage I showed you earlier, talking about 35 to 40 soldiers, 17 were definitely killed. Um, how many wounded is unknown? The trenches were not saved. The stronghold lost its ability to defend. Um, so there you go. Uh, uh, could that intercept call have anything to do with that? Well, similar sorts of situation, perhaps. Um, okay, this is all from War Monitor. A few indications that the MLS and HIMARS are still doing a really, really good job. And I think it's worth remembering that every single night, and possibly day as well, all the time, those HIMARS are working and they are doing their stuff and they're hitting command post after command post, troop accumulation, depot, ammunition dumps, whatever. They're hitting these things on a consistent basis, and that must be really painful for the Russians. On a long-term basis, that, that is going on not just one, two, three weeks in a row, but now however many months they've had high Mars, that is going to be uh, a, an absolute nightmare for the Russians logistically and in terms of morale and in terms of you know being able to uh, commit the the right equipment to the right places so Ukrainian long-range MLRS successfully hit in the last day so this is just one day five control points four personal composition areas so that troop accumulations uh, six artillery positions two ammunition warehouses and a fuel and lubricant warehouse with precision strikes so that's just one day and then the Air Force in the last day, so this is the same day, have con conducted 22 successful strikes on areas of concentration of personnel, weapons, and military equipment. And then he goes on to say, and that Tokmak uh, strike, which I talked about is near Melitopol, resulted in 10 plus pieces of equipment destroyed and 180 plus Russian soldiers injured. So that's just what I'm doing is breaking that down to a single example. But those, you know, that's one example of all all of these things you know that's just one but these are happening multiple times 
every single day and every single night. And that's got to be really well, I, I think this is the most successful aspect of the Ukrainian uh, war is the high Mars. And that's why I do maintain that they really, really are or were a game changer. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about is my good friend Elon Musk. If you are a, a fan of Elon Musk, just close your ears or at least have a little think about that because uh, he is just being an absolute Oh, I really want to swear. He he's being an absolute idiot, uh, an idiot of the of the of the highest proportions. So, what's happened? Well, he's taken over Twitter, and he was forced to take over Twitter because he wanted to pull out of taking over Twitter. But in the kind of rules of engagement in trying to making a bid to take over Twitter, there was a kind of clause that if he pulled out, then he'd have to buy it for this money. It, 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 the long and short of it is the cheapest option for him was to buy Twitter in the end, even though he didn't really want to. Now, he has called himself, uh, uh, and this is linked to Ukraine, don't you worry. Um, he has called himself a free speech absolutist, right? So if you're a free speech absolutist, then you would expect anyone to be able to say what they like, right? So the first thing that happened is that there was an account, I think it was called Elon Jet, that was basically doing open source intelligence, tracking Elon Musk's private jet using publicly available data, right? There's nothing particularly dodgy about that. Mapping his private jet and seeing where around the world he was flying and what he was getting up to type thing. Now, the first problem, this is where it's relevant for open source intelligence, is that he, he banned that account. He said, you can't do that, it's banned that. And then he changed the rules of Twitter so that people can no longer publish public information or pu publicly pu publish information on the whereabouts of entities live, right? And of course, that's entirely what geolocation is. So you've got loads of open source intelligence uh, providers saying we can no longer do our work, we can't do geolocation on Twitter because uh, Elon Musk has changed the the rules because you got all sensitive about his private jet being um being talked about in public and then what happened is he just went a whole step further and you know bear in mind elon musk is supposedly a free speech absolutist in other words you can say absolutely what you want it's it's free speech and what did he do last night he started suspending and a lot of journalists who were critical of Elon Musk. In other words, you can't say what you want, because if you do say what you want, you get cancelled, you get banned. All the sorts of things you so often hear from free speech absolutists. Oh, cancel culture, cancel culture. Oh, who are the ones that are doing that? You are. Anyone, this is my opinion, but anyone who claims that, who talks that often about free speech is only really interested in being given the permission to insult someone else publicly. We know that Trump um, not Trump. We know that uh, Musk did that, Freudian slip, uh, with the guy, the British diver who helped those Thai children out, uh, footballers out of um, the cave system in Thailand. And Musk called him a pedo and wanted to be able to say that and then got called out and got taken to court and so on and so forth. But he wants to be able to, uh, free speech, free speech. I can say what I, I, I want to be able to. I want to be able to insult who I like. Now, as soon as someone does some critical journalism of Elon Musk, they get shut down. They get their account suspended. So Ben Collins, who himself is a is a journalist, talks about New York Times. Um, I don't I don't know the actual names of some of these people, but their Twitter handles. So a New York Times reporter suspended. Mashable sub reporter last night suspended. Another uh, journalist suspended, and then this was uh, Washington Post's. Um, uh, reporter before he was suspended and his last uh, um, tweet uh, and his last tweet was really interesting so Twitter also suspended so Mastodon is this place where a lot of people are going uh, as an alternative to Twitter and I, I don't know whether the open source intelligence community might start migrating there or has done or I know a number of people have got uh, a foot in both places um, and then Mastodon the account from Mastodon on Twitter, who's saying "come and join Mastodon," was shut. Was then suspended by by Twitter as well, um, and then Intercept journalists suspended. Political pundit um, Keith Olbermann suspended. 
uh, just wow, just absolutely wow. Um, uh, and on and on it goes. Uh, Steve Herman, the chief national correspondent for the US government funded Voice of America, suspended from Twitter. Um, uh, just absolutely incredible. Um, and uh, Elon Musk has, has said this tweet before. This is from uh, April this year. I heard that even my worst critics remain on Twitter because that's what free speech means. Oh, oh that didn't age well. Uh, all I can say is if you're a fan of Twitter, uh, sorry, if you're a fan of Elon Musk, you really need to have a long, hard look at yourself because the guy is a grade A plonker. And, uh, I, and it's the, that kind of hypocrisy that gets me. You know, be a free speech absolutist. Okay. Free speech is a broken concept, by the way, is the philosophically un untenable it's because everyone has a line, right? If, 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 so free speech absolutism is allowing a 12-year-old child to stand up in class and swear and shout and scream at that teacher to, to the top of their, their voice, right? And the worst swear words and the worst invectives and racial abuse to, to the teacher, right? If you think that's unacceptable, that shouldn't happen, we need to stop that happening, then okay. Free speech is a bit of a problem. Like, but as somewhere along the line, we draw our own lines of what's accepted and what's not. And it's just where you draw that line. That's that's all the debate's about. You can't be a free speech absolutist because you're just accepting anything. Anyone can say anything to anyone in whatever manner they, they like at any point in time, anywhere in the world. That's free speech absolutism. And it doesn't really work. That's not how we would like society to operate. Um, uh, but instead, you know, here's a guy that's saying, OK, I'm a free speech absolutist. So, OK, you, uh, f that's just short shorthand for free speech is really important to you. You think people should be allowed to say what they like because you want to be able to say what you like. And it turns out that that's not at all what he believes, not at all what he believes, because he suspended a whole bunch of reporters who are doing their job because he owns this big platform now. And, and it's it's annoying me to, I mean, if the open source intelligence community wasn't embedded so strongly in Twitter, I'd be right off there in a, in a, in a jiffy. But it's just where everyone's at and where all the information is. So I need it. I need Twitter as a place to do my, my job here of trying to collate and assimilate all this information. Um, but yeah, just um, it's a it's a really sad state of affairs, and I, I just I really wish he hadn't taken over Twitter at all, and it was just as it was, you know, a couple of months ago. But alas, that's not to be. So where it's going to go and what's going to happen, and and whether people are just going to start um, running away, I don't know. It's going to be really interesting. Free speech for me, but not for V. Um, exactly. Uh, so yeah, one to look out for, and the reason why that's important is because it really does have a very genuine impact on on open source intelligence and the people who are working so hard to bring information about what's going on uh, in the in the Russia Ukraine war just to let you know please check out the article i referred to earlier it's called he shouted too early the impotence of putin um and it's about the escalation or possibly the lack of escalation the lack of risk of escalation in, in going to nuclear now and so therefore you know, let's try and give Ukraine as much as we can. Anyway, hopefully that was interesting for you. Thanks for, you know, indulging me and putting up with this. Uh, please like, subscribe, share. Um, and other ways to help the channel are down in the description box below. In the meantime, take care and I'll see you tomorrow.